Welcome to Life, Love and Light. I'm Veronica Mary Rolfe, and in this series of podcasts, we're delving into the wisdom of the beloved medieval mystic Julian of Norwich to discover how her revelations of divine love may inspire, encourage, and guide us on our own spiritual path. Last week, in the twelfth revelation, Julian heard Christ pour out a magnificent litany of who he is, I it am. This litany described in Christ's own words the endless ways in which he is present to the human mind and heart. We reflected on what I it am means to us in our present time of suffering, fear and anxiety. Today, we will begin exploring Julian's 13th revelation, All Shall Be Well. This is the sublime revelation that defines Julian's mystical wisdom to most people around the world. But just before we begin, I want to answer a question I've received repeatedly about my two books on Julian. What's the difference between them? For those of you who wish to learn more about Julian, let me explain briefly. My first book on Julian was Julian's Gospel, Illuminating the Life and Revelations of Julian of Norwich, published by Orbis Books. Now this is a historical reconstruction of Julian's life, as well as an in-depth interpretation of every chapter of the long text of her revelations. And it includes my own translations from the Middle English. Julian's Gospel was a five-year labor of research, writing, rewriting, and love. It received outstanding reviews around the world, became a bestseller, and won four national book awards, including a First Place Book Award from the Catholic Press Association and the Nautilus Gold Medal for Religion. It's a comprehensive yet very readable book on Julian's life and revelations. And then, because of the success of Julian's Gospel, I was commissioned by InterVarsity Academic Press to write an Explorer's Guide to Julian of Norwich. This book won the IVP 2018 Reader's Choice Award and also received stellar reviews and has also been a bestseller. And while this is a much shorter book than Julian's Gospel, it still includes a historical overview of Julian's life, a succinct analysis of each revelation, a glossary of Julian's favorite terms, an examination of her major themes, and as well, a final chapter on making a retreat with Julian of Norwich. So if you're just learning about Julian, this is the perfect first guide to her revelations. And then you may want to go deeper and read Julian's Gospel. Of course, there's so much more about Julian and her revelations in my books than I can possibly fit into these weekly podcasts. But I am constantly drawing on my research for these two books in preparing my podcasts. And then I add my own reflections, especially relating Julian's revelations, to the crises and anxieties we're experiencing in our families, in our work lives, and in our world crisis right now. So I hope this answers your questions and helps you decide which of my books is better for you. Now we arrive at Julian's monumental 13th revelation. She writes, and after this, our Lord brought to my mind the longing that I had for him before, and I saw that nothing prevented me but sin. And so I beheld this generally in us all, and it seemed to me, if sin had not been, we should all have been as clean and alike to our Lord 
as he made us. And thus in my folly before this time, often I wondered why, by the great foreseeing wisdom of God, the beginning of sin was not stopped. For then I thought that all would have been well. The problem of evil had arisen before in the third revelation. When Julian wrote, I marveled in that sight with a soft dread and thought, what is sin? But now, even as she beholds Christ in glory, that unanswered question arises from the depths of Julian's soul in a slightly different form. This time she does not ask, what? But why? Why is there sin at all? If sin had never happened, we would all be as pure and perfect as God created us to be. We would be like Adam and Eve in paradise before the fall. We would be on intimate terms with God. Our intellect would have no limitations. Our will would be inclined to virtue and possess the complete freedom not to sin. Our body would be entirely subject to our will and immune from all physical suffering. We would be clothed by God in a state of perfect grace, beatitude, and enlightenment. We would be fully able to persevere in doing God's will. And we would never have to die. Julian admits that to question this matter of sin is folly, though she has done it many times in her life, wondering why did God in his great foreseeing wisdom not prevent the beginning of sin? If God knew in advance that sin would so severely damage his magnificent creation and bring untold suffering to human beings, why did he allow it to happen? For if sin had never been allowed, then, according to Julian's very human perspective, which has been shared by philosophers and theologians and lay people in every age, then she figures all would have been well. But she writes, This stirring was much to be rejected. But nevertheless, I mourned and sorrowed over it, lacking reason and discretion. But Jesus, who in this vision informed me of all that I needed, answered by this word and said, Sin is behovely, but all shall be well, and all shall be well and all manner of thing shall be well. Now here is certainly the most famous quotation from Julian's Revelations. But most of the time, you only hear the all shall be well part, not the sin is behovely but part that precedes it. Christ's words to Julian seem to have been prompted by her own suggestion that all would have been well if there had been no sin. However, Christ does not agree with her reasoning. He tells Julian that sin is behovely, but all shall be well. That is, all shall be well in spite of sin and on an entirely different plane of existence in an ultimate way. Now what is this word behovely? Well in Middle English it bears the connotations of useful, necessary, even advantageous. It's very close to behoove in the sense that it's necessary, proper, or even helpful. Now these startling meanings as applied to sin suddenly bring to mind the ancient exultant, the hymn of praise sung before the paschal candle at the Easter vigil, which describes the sin of Adam as, O happy fault, O necessary sin of Adam, which has gained for us so great a Redeemer. 
could the concept of sin as the gravest affront to God and the curse of humanity become so transformed in Christ that it might be deemed necessary, useful, even advantageous? We know that St. Paul wrote, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And St. Augustine taught that God can bring good even out of evil. And this is because of Christ's perfect sacrifice that triumphed over sin and death. But Julian simply doesn't understand what Christ is telling her. How could sin be necessary, even advantageous in some cases? Julian has seen so much sin and suffering in her life, and the Church taught her that those who die in mortal sin will be condemned to hell. So she simply cannot understand how all will be well if even one person is condemned. And Julian's mental anguish is not just an excessive medieval preoccupation with sin. It is all of humanity's innate sense of our lives being terribly broken, and we don't know how to fix them. Look around at the state of our world today. It's obvious that we are completely helpless to solve our problems on our own. And Julian had long endured the sting of sin in her own life. She'd seen its all-pervasive damage all around her, the anger, the violence, the brutality, the wars, the inordinate power and, and wealth in the hands of a few titled aristocrats, while the poor peasant population suffered terribly all around her, as well as the grave misdeeds of those in powerful positions in the church. All of these weighed heavily on her soul. And then, and then there were the famines, droughts, and the outbreak of the deadly plague, as well as fires, earthquakes, floods, and the destruction of the earth. So Julian understood only too well that these are results of the grave misdeeds of human beings toward one another, which in turn cause catastrophic upheavals in nature. Indeed, the evil of sin perpetrates every form of violence and abuse visited on the young and the strong, on infants and the aged, on the infirm and the weak. Sin destroys families and disrupts governments, sets one nation against the other, casts down empires. It penetrates into every level of our physical environment. It infects every aspect of our daily life. It causes bigotry, persecution, alienation. Julian reveals that she was shown the history of suffering in the world, quote, in a touch and readily passed over into comfort. She couldn't have taken any more. However, she admits she did not see sin itself because she believed, quote, it hath no manner of substance nor no part of being, nor may it be known except by the pain that it causes. But she understood that this pain, this suffering we undergo because of sin, eventually forces us to plead for mercy and be purged of our sinfulness. And all the while, Julian understood that our Lord comforts us, saying, It is true that sin is the cause of all this pain, but all shall be well 
and all manner of thing shall be well. These words were shown full tenderly, showing no manner of blame to me, nor to none that shall be saved. Then it would be a great unkindness of me to blame or wonder at God for my sin, since he blames me not for sin. With these remarkable words, Julian received a direct intuition of a high and marvelous secret hidden in God. She says that this secret will allow us to see why sin came into the world. And she writes, in which sight we shall endlessly have joy. She affirms that all the sufferings we must endure because of sin, both individually and collectively as a nation, great as they may be, are only for a time in the eternal scheme of things. And in that time, our suffering and sorrow for sin humble and purify us, teach us our flaws and weaknesses, and bring us to our knees in search of God's mercy. And as such, sin can be beholdly, useful, necessary, even fitting and good, as Christ has said. It can have a positive outcome, and this is because of Christ's own transforming sacrifice on the cross. And Julian understands that this transformation of sin and decay into glory is possible only because the passion of Christ strengthens us to endure the effects of sin. And she believes it is precisely Christ's will that his passion should do so. Now, while Julian never denies God's sovereign right to judge and even possibly to condemn sinners for their sin, she writes only what she saw and she heard what was revealed to her, namely that she did not see sin, she did not see divine blame, she did not see everlasting punishment. Quite the contrary. She writes, I saw how Christ has compassion on us because of sin. And just as before in the passion of Christ, I was filled with pain and compassion. So in this, I was in part filled with compassion for all my even Christians. Yes, this realization fills Julian with the greatest love and pity for all her fellow Christians who, like herself, suffer the effects of sin. And she writes, and I saw that each natural compassion that a human being has for his or her, even Christians, with charity, it is Christ in him. So when we feel compassion for others and what they undergo because of sin, that is Christ's compassion within us. According to Julian, Christ also wants us to know that because of his own passion, all of our sufferings, all we go through because of sin, will be turned into honors. And the great profit of our souls, like the honors given to saints in heaven who once were grave sinners. She even goes through quite a litany of sinners she knew who had become saints. And we never, ever suffer alone, but always along with Christ. She says that in his great courtesy, he takes away all our blame and beholds us with compassion and pity as children, innocent and not loathsome. Well, remarkably, even after all these reassuring insights, 
Julian still did not understand how all might be well. She was not easily convinced. She still had questions, as do we. She writes, But in this I stood my ground, contemplating generally, anxiously and mournfully, saying thus to our Lord in my meaning with the greatest dread, Ah, good Lord, how might all be well for the great harm that has come by sin to thy creatures? And here I desired, as far as I dared, to have some more open teaching wherewith I might be eased in this. Well, Christ is not in the least offended by Julian's persistent questioning. In fact, he welcomes it. With a loving expression, he answers her, quote, Adam's sin was the most harm that ever was done or ever shall be done to the world's end. In this, Julian was reminded that the fall of humankind into sin, however it happened, as it's described in the Genesis story of Adam and Eve's disobedience, it was the worst of all sins. Why? Well, Adam and Eve had been given every kind of goodness and happiness and intimacy with God, and yet they turned their backs on God. And they thought they could be self-sufficient. They thought they could be gods unto themselves. They thought they didn't have to obey their creator. Yet Christ did not want Julian to focus on that or any other devastating sin. Rather, Christ wanted her to behold his own glorious atonement. She says, The Lord wants us all to take heed of this, For since I have made well the greatest harm, then it is my will that thou know thereby that I shall make well all that is less. We must understand Christ's reparation was so much more pleasing to God than Adam's sin was ever harmful. And the Savior raised humanity to a nobility so much higher than it had before that the two acts, Adam's sin and Christ's atonement, cannot even be compared. This is so important for us to consider. Christ wants this teaching completely understood and devoutly taken into account in every situation. If he has made well, the greatest harm ever done to human nature, then he can and will make well every other lesser harm done, every other sin ever committed. No evil is too great or too small to be made well by Christ's redemptive power. And this is because Christ's mercy for the sinner is greater than any sin. And thus our good Lord answered to all the questions and doubts that I might make, saying very comfortingly, I may make all thing well, and I can make all thing well, and I will make all thing well, and I shall make all thing well, and thou shalt see thyself that all manner of thing shall be well. So in spite of all the questions and the doubts that arose in her mind, the Lord took pity on Julian and yet again gave her the promise of his unfailing power, escalating into a a crescendo as if answering each objection arising in Julian's heart one by one. Christ tells her five ways in which he personally makes all thing well. For Julian, these are clear and concise. She remembered them exactly. Each one is layered with a deeper meaning. And since the Middle English wheel, W-E-L-E, 
or wella, was a form of fullness of health. It meant not only well in our modern sense, but the greatest happiness and prosperity, hence well-being. So, first Christ may make all things well, because he is supreme power. He is able to do all that needs to be done. Second, he can, and that's from the Middle English, C-A-N-N, -N, meaning canny. He knows the best way to do it, because he is divine wisdom and understands how to perfect his own creation. Third, he will, in the sense that he chooses to do so, since the Father's will will be done. Fourth, he shall, which is an even stronger verb than will in Middle English. And this word expresses Christ's absolute intention to make everything well. And fifth, Christ promises Julian in no uncertain terms that she shall see herself that this shall be done. And Julian explicates even further. She says that by I may, she understood the working of the Father. By I can, that of the Son. By I will, that of the Holy Ghost and by I shall, the unity of the Blessed Trinity, three persons and one truth. And in the saying, Thou shalt see thyself, she understood not only herself, but, quote, the oneing of all humankind that shall be saved into the blissful Trinity. In these five words, may, can, will, shall, and shall see, Julian says that God will be enclosed in rest and in peace. And this will be when Christ's own spiritual thirst for souls is finally quenched. Indeed, here Julian is implying that through our faith that God will make all things well, God becomes enclosed in the rest and peace of our own human hearts. And it is in our heart that Christ himself longs to rest. She writes, Therefore this is his thirst, a love longing to have us all together, whole in him, to his endless bliss as to my sight. For we are not now as fully whole in him as we shall be then. Christ's spiritual thirst is described here as a love longing. It's like that of a human parent who wants to have the whole family gathered together, safe and happy, never to be parted or separated again. Indeed, Christ aches to have all his children made whole and one within himself, enjoying endless bliss. But until such time as we are brought up to heaven and united with Christ, we will never be completely whole. Julian further acknowledges that God is continually making well, not only the noblest and the greatest things, but also the least little things. Oh, we must hang on Christ's words, counting on him to make all things well, even though we have no idea, no idea how he will ever do it. We must believe that he can and he wants to do it. Such belief does not arise easily. It's an acquired habit. It takes continual and determined practice. But if we do, practice such a belief, day in and day out, then at the last end we will be able to see truly in the fullness of joy how Christ has done it. And as we are purified by our suffering, we will gradually develop 
the enlightened minds and hearts to see how all things are being made well. Nothing, absolutely nothing, will be forgotten. So the big question is, are these words of Christ a statement of fact about what has been fulfilled, or prophecy concerning what will be accomplished at the end of the world? The answer is both, I think. In God's sight, salvation is already accomplished. It is finished, were Christ's last words before he bowed his head and gave up his spirit on the cross. And with his perfect sacrifice, Christ has overcome the demon, every demon, and our particular demons. Evil is fully routed. In the mind of God, all has already been made well. Christ's death and resurrection is our solemn guarantee that this is so. This is the only real reality. But from our side, these words are still prophecy. They're full of promise and hope, but they are not yet fulfilled for each one of us still mired in our ignorance and what Julian calls our contrariousness. We simply cannot behold the way God beholds, nor imagine how God could make things well that are obviously not well to our way of seeing right now. We will not be able to envision how he converts evil into good as long as we ourselves are bound by our ignorant views and our sinful habits and our grasping to self and our lack of faith. Christ is speaking to Julian of the ultimate, all shall be well, not the temporary one. Because Christ did not promise all manner of things shall be well tomorrow or the next day or the next year or at any time during the course of our lives on this earth. And Julian certainly did not imply immediate solutions to life's problems when she recorded Christ's words for posterity. In fact, to interpret Christ's words as meaning he will fix everything exactly to our liking, mend our broken relationships, heal our aches and pains, end all world conflicts, even dispense justice in the way we think it should be dispensed, is to misinterpret the revelation. The pandemic will have to take its course. We will have to struggle with lost income, lost jobs, lost opportunities, lost education, lost connections, lost freedoms. We will have to mourn lost loved ones. We will have to work our way through our personal crises by walking in the dark. But as St. Paul tells us, we walk by faith, not by sight. That final metamorphosis, when all shall be well, will not, cannot be fully experienced by us here and now. We simply do not yet have the minds to see how all shall be well. We simply do not yet have the mind of Christ. We are still in process of becoming perfected. So we still must carry our daily cross. We still can't see what lies ahead for our loved ones or for ourselves. But... And this is the crucial point. We cling to our faith that Christ will be with us in every step, every breath of our lives, helping us to make good decisions and to bear our crosses. And we hope that we will feel his strength and grace as he works in small ways and large 
to transform all our struggles and sufferings into his perfect joy. Nothing is too large or too small for Christ to transform. That is the essence of our Christian faith, that all suffering and death has already been transformed in Christ's glorious resurrection. We just can't see it yet. And some days we can hardly believe it. Yet we persevere. We wait to see, trusting yet not knowing, how the transformation of all things into good will be accomplished. And I think if we take these words of our Lord to Julian as our mantra and say them to ourselves in times of worry or crisis, they will soon embody our act of faith in the Lord's working, our immense trust, and that will enable us to see better in the darkness. And if we reassure one another that all shall be well with a deep understanding of the true meaning of these words and say them with absolute conviction that the Lord is at work in every situation, then think how we will enable others to experience their divine power as well. And in our meditation practice, as we learn to move back, back, back in our mind and become more aware of our thoughts and the convoluted feelings we attach to those thoughts. And as we watch how our memories arise and sometimes overwhelm us, and as we begin to understand they are not the core of who we are, then we will begin to see the conflicts and crises in our minds from Christ's point of view. We will begin to let go and rest in Christ's heart that is always love, always mercy, always grace. And even though our troubled thoughts and our deep emotions and our very real worries will sometimes threaten to overpower us, we will always be able to take refuge in the silence and stillness of Christ's heart. That is where we are safe. That is where we experience the transformation. The more we trust that Christ is at work in everything that is happening to us right now, in our families, in our work, in our world, the more we will begin to perceive the face of reality begin to change. We will notice acts of kindness perhaps we didn't notice before. We will feel inspired to reach out of our own desperation to help others in theirs. We will start imagining creative ways to help ourselves and others get through our shared crises and we will see opportunities where before we only saw roadblocks. Trusting that Christ in us is making all things well, we become agents of his own work. We become instruments of his peace, his hope, his healing. And the more faithful we are to resting in the silence, in our meditation practice every day, the more we will believe in the process of this divine transfiguration that is really and truly happening. And then all shall become well, little by little. Gradually, we may begin to live our lives in the divine dimension through our faith, our hope, and like Julian, our joy that the Lord is at work in everything. And gradually we will develop the mind of Christ. Ultimately, of course, the only way all manner of thing can possibly be made well 
will be through our complete transformation through death and rebirth in Christ. Only when our minds and our hearts are illuminated within a state of perfect knowing and perfect loving, that is, when we enter into the beatific vision, will we be able to comprehend what reality truly is in the light of God. And then, and only then, on a completely glorified plane of existence, will we see ourselves that all manner of thing shall be well. So let us move now into meditation. And as always, take as much time with this and every meditation as you wish or you need. I just give you the outline. Find a comfortable position. Check relaxation throughout your body. Allow your body to rest as though sinking into the earth. And feel the strength of earth's energy begin to rise, brightening and enlivening your body and spirit. And then let the breath flow out all the way as though it, it's been stirred up from below. But now it must be released. Open your mouth if you need to. Let out your breath. And then as you continue to breathe more gently, release thoughts that arise on both the inhalation and the exhalation. Release the thoughts on the inhalation as if they're being freed into the sky. Release the thoughts on the exhalation as though they're being poured out into space. And then when you're ready, very gently bring your mind towards your heart and know that Christ is already sitting there, always listening, always watching. What keeps you from seeking refuge in him all the time? Pour your worries and your fears into his own chalice that he may transform them. What particular strength do you need from him today? See him offering you his Eucharist Feel its power spreading through your whole being, holding you steady, unshakably steady. What is it to give yourself to following him so that nothing will ever take you from him? What is it to renew your promise in love? breath by breath. Trust completely that his divine awareness permeates all things. Nothing is beyond his power to forgive and heal and transform. Now surrender completely to this divine process of transformation without getting in the way. Let your awareness of Christ in your heart be still 
oh so still. Allow him to reveal to you his own nature as the source of all creation, the very maker of time and space. And if your mind starts to get caught up in thoughts or emotions, you can always return to the breath, aware of the releasing and the surrendering to his divine will. Offer and commit your whole being to the divine presence working within you. And dedicate your love and all your energies to Christ's own process of making all things well in his own time and place and way. Let go trying to figure it out or having it done your own way. Rest there in the stillness of Christ's own awareness as long as you wish in total union with Christ's work in you and in the world and then without praying, without verbalizing Simply unite yourself with Christ's infinite prayer that will, that is, that already has made all things well. And make your own promise to do whatever it takes to continue dwelling in union with him there. Amen. I encourage you to share these Life, Love and Light podcasts with your family and friends around the world who are in such need of spiritual guidance and hope right now. Julian's revelations of God's love and tender mercy are such healing and comfort. Please be sure to click subscribe or follow to get weekly notifications of each new episode. And I invite you to visit my new dedicated podcast website, Life Love Light Podcast.com. And if you have any questions or would like to share your response to these podcasts, please write me at either juliansvoice.com or veronicamaryrolf.com. I would love hearing from you. And if you wish to make a donation on any of my three websites to support the cost of producing these free podcasts, I would be very grateful. Next week, we will continue to delve into the spiritual riches of Julian's 13th revelation. There is so much more to discover. We will examine Julian's understanding of the great deed that the Lord will accomplish on the last day and question whether Julian is hinting here at universal salvation. We will also explore Julian's understanding of the godly will in each soul that has never fully assented to sin. These are astounding prophecies you won't want to miss. So until next week, I wish you all the blessings of divine life, love, and light. <laughs>